In this video, we will discuss what we will call a dot-com bubble 2.1 and ask where we are in the growth of the bubble and in potentially bursting that bubble. My name is Kirby Arcundiff. I have a PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I'm a chartered financial analyst and a certified financial planner. I currently work as a chief economist. This is a graph of the Wilshire growth divided by the Wilshire value index. The Wilshire 5000 has roughly the entire United States market in it, and the growth stocks would be the tech stocks, the high growth stocks, the high price to earnings ratio stocks. The value stocks would be the low PDE ratio, sort of standard high dividend paying stocks that are probably more stable. The last time we saw elevations similar to what have happened in the last few years was during the 2000 dot-com bubble, where the Wilshire growth to Wilshire value index peaked at well over 1.5. Normally, it's around 1, and after the bursting of that bubble went down to well below 1, this area right here would be what is called the housing bubble. So today, this index is around 1.44, somewhere in that area. And it has been elevated since the increase in tech stocks during the pandemic. We had a drop down during 2022, and it has been elevated since then. So we're going to refer to this time period as the initial dot-com bubble, our dot-com bubble one. This is 2.0, and now we would call 2.1. An examination of the kind of pain experienced by investors during the bursting of the first dot-com bubble can be seen by looking at QQQ, the NASDAQ tracking ETF, and you can see here that peaked in 2000, around 109. During the bursting of the dot-com bubble, it shrank over around a three-year period, losing over 75% of its value. Not something you would want to be invested in. It took around 15 years for investors at that peak to recover their investment. If we look at the larger SPY, the S&P 500 tracking index, we can see it exhibited a similar pattern to QQQ peaking in 2000, and then dropping over a three-year period, rallying back up, peaking during the housing bubble, dropping back down again, and then peaking so far today at a slight elevation to where it was in 2000. So investing in the S&P 500, you would have basically made no money as a buy and hold investor until the last few months. If we look at some of the MAG7 components that have been around since the dot-com bubble, many of them haven't, we can see a similar pattern. Here is Apple Computer, and it had a peak during 2000 during the dot-com bubble, had a very significant drop back to about the same price it was at before the dot-com bubble, rallied back up, and you would have broken even if you had invested in Apple at the peak of the dot-com bubble in about five years. Microsoft, similar pattern, it peaked in 2000, dropped down drastically after the bursting of the dot-com bubble, and you would have finally been reimbursed of your investment in around fifth years. Amazon, also a similar pattern, peaked during 2000 in the dot-com bubble, dropped over the next three years. You would have broken even if you had invested during the peak of the dot-com bubble in around seven years. Tesla has not been around long enough to experience the dot-com bubble but obviously it 
rallied significantly during dot-com bubble 2.0 and has since dropped by around 50%. Um, we may see similar patterns in other MAG-7 stocks in the near future. If we look at a, another darling of the dot-com bubble 2.0, Zoom, when during the pandemic everybody was sitting at home talking to each other and the working from home phenomena occurred, we can see that it peaked at close to 500 during dot-com bubble 2.0 and has dropped down to around 70 since then. So it's worth, well, more than 10% of its peak value. How long did dot-com bubble 1.0 last? If we blow up our earlier graph, we can see the time periods near 2000. Right now, we are around 1.44 are in this range. So we can see that stocks were elevated above this range based on the Wilshire Growth Over Value Index from around December of 1999 to around November of 2000. So it was around 11 months. And we did have, of course, sort of a double peak in that bubble, dropping down in 2000 in June and then coming back up before the final drastic decrease in price. We can also look at other measurements of the bubblish behavior of the market, the stock market valuation price to earnings ratio on the S&P 500, or the price of the S&P 500 divided by last year's trailing 12-month earnings. If we look at this, we can see that while well, the current price to earnings ratio is highly elevated, it has been this elevated in the past, and that elevation can last for several years before ultimately you get a bursting of the bubble. For example, during the dot-com bubble, this lasted for around a three-year time period. A second way of measuring price-to-earnings ratios is the Schiller price-to-earnings ratios. That would be the price of the S&P 500 divided by the average 12-month trailing earnings over a 10-year time period. Again, you can see that this price-to-earnings ratio is highly elevated, but it has been this elevated at two times during the past, during dot-com bubble 2.0, again, we are in 2.1, and the first dot-com bubble around 2000, and that elevation lasted for around a three-year time period. So, well, markets are highly elevated now, well, they can potentially get worse. Or better if you're currently invested and can somehow figure out how to sell at the top. We can now look at the current darling of the stock market, NVIDIA, which has made a lot of money in the last year and has a highly elevated price. You have made a ton of money if you invested in it due to the current AI craze. Um, the video stock price has gone up from, oh, 250 back here just a few months ago to over $800. So a great thing to be invested during this time period. A analogy of NVIDIA during the first dot-com bubble would be Sun Microsystems. Everybody was buying the servers then to play out the internet investments. And we can see how Sun behaved. 1999 started here around $10, peaked at $64 before plunging again down to about where it started before the beginning of the dot-com bubble in 2003. So going from 64 down to Five. not a good thing to be invested in, and then eventually the company was sold out. 
This is a statement from Scott McNeely, the co-founder of Sun Microsystems, in 2002, after the bursting of the first dot-com bubble, at 10 times revenues to give you a 10-year payback, I have to pay you 100% of revenues for 10 straight years in dividends. That assumes I can get that by my shareholders. That assumes I have zero cost of goods sold, which is very hard for a computer company. That assumes zero expenses, which is really hard with 39,000 employees. That assumes I pay no taxes, which is very hard. And that assumes you pay no taxes on your dividends, which is kind of illegal. And that assumes with zero research and development for the next 10 years, I can maintain the current revenue run rate. Now, having done that, would any of you like to buy my stock at $64, which was the peak of the stock during the dot-com bubble? Do you realize how ridiculous those basic assumptions are? You don't need any transparency. You don't need any footnotes. What were you thinking? Scott McNeely, Business Week, 2002. So he is saying that 10 times revenues or 10 times sales is an insane price to invest in a company, in particular a computer company. This is the graph for NVIDIA. If we look down here at the price to sales ratio, it is 32 are three times what the price to sales ratio was of Sun Microsystems at its peak. To show how insane many of the stock valuations are in our current markets, this is the data on Windstop, a chicken company. It has a price to sales ratio of around 24, over twice what Sun Microsystems was at its peak. If we look at a graph of the total market cap of stocks with a price to sales ratio greater than 20, we see that there was around $3.6 trillion of those during the first dot-com bubble, and obviously that dropped drastically after the bursting of that bubble. Well, at least in 2021, and it's about the same or higher today, there were $4.5 trillion of stocks in that range. And I would expect, just like this happened here, a dollar invested here and left you with pennies a few years later, you're going to see something similar over the next few years. For further reading on these kind of topics, you can look at my sources for much of this data, finance.yahoo.com, Guru Focus, um, Kalish Concepts, Long-Term Trends has a lot of excellent graphical data, and Multiple.com. I thank you for watching this video.